My next guest is launching his own global counter movement while also running to become a member of the European Parliament. Yanis Varoufakis is the former Greek finance minister who resigned in 2015 amid contentious debt negotiations at the time with the EU. And he's joining me now from Athens. Yanis Varoufakis, welcome to the program. Thank you, Christian. So, you know, to be honest. I, I brought up 2015 and it seemed that you couldn't go a day without hearing about Brexit and a potential Greek default and chaos in, in your land and across Europe and reverberating all over the world. And here we are, but nearly four years later, Brexit is in chaos, but it's happening. These populist and extreme waves of nationalism that you were talking about back then seem to be the order of the day way beyond Greece. I mean, you were pretty prescient back then. Well, Christian, in 2008, we, our generation, experienced uh, our version of 1929. It began in Wall Street, just like in 1929. And very soon, the world ceased to make sense in uh, uh, terms of what was conventional wisdom up until very recently. We, uh, well, our regimes, our liberal establishment, to put it this way, just like the Weimar Republic in the 1920s, pretended that business could continue as usual. Of course, the major fault lines in finance uh, made it essential in order to pretend that business could continue as usual, to shift pain, loss, uh, uh, debt onto the shoulders of the weakest of citizens, especially in the, in the European Union, but also in the United States. And very soon you had discontent, and that discontent begot political monsters, mm -hmm. both in Europe and in the United States. So political monsters, some, you know, people would potentially describe the extreme right and the extreme left as being these sort of political monsters, if you like. At least they're gobbling up any sense of a centrist future, any sense that you can even find a majority for anything, and a consensus to make uh, policy. So you have described the threat from this nationalism and this populism, and you are launching DM25, which you hope to be a progressive international, a progressive wave to counter this mostly extreme right nationalism. Can you explain how you plan to do that? And what is DM25? Well, DiEM25 is an acronym for the Democracy in Europe movement, but we are also using the, you know, the exaltation carpet DiEM, seize the, seize the day, because we need to seize the day. As you can see in Europe, we have uh, um, a domino effect, uh, or takeovers of our polities by extremists of the right, xenophobes, who are um, exploiting the discontent and the anger in order to turn against one proud nation against another, turn Italians against the Roma, against uh, um, uh, migrants and so on. So we need to seize the day. But allow me just to put it very simply. What we're trying to do is to take one brilliant idea from uh, Franklin Roosevelt's administration in 1933, from the New Deal. And that simple idea is to utilize, to find smart ways of utilizing existing idle cash, idle money, savings that are not being invested into productive, useful things for humanity, into the good quality jobs that can uniquely quell the discontent caused by the fact that most people can see that their children are not going to have as good a life as they did, mm -hmm. and press this idle cash into service in order for uh, green transition, green technologies, green, green energy, green transport systems. That basic idea, which in a sense allowed the United States in 1933 onwards to avoid the decline of Europe, the degeneration of Europe at the same time into a kind of fascist uh, equilibrium, mm -hmm. uh, that is an idea that we want to salvage from that period, to bring it to Europe and indeed to internationalize it if we can, so as to counter at an internationalist level both the failures of the globalization, Davos, uh, if you want, uh, establishment that caused the crisis of 2008 uh, and the, 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 the political mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, representation of the extremists who are now taking over one country after the other. Okay, so let's let's take one country after the other. Let's start with France, where we've seen the most violent manifestation of this discontent. And you have what many in the liberal, democratic, sort of moderate kind of center saw as a beacon of hope. The election of President Macron, who, who defeated precisely the voice of nationalism and extremism, Marine Le Pen on the right and, and, uh, and, and Mélenchon on the left. And now we've had these massive and violent protests, and we simply don't know even whether the president's you know, backsliding uh, is going to placate them. What is it that, that, first of all, do you agree with this, with this demonstration of discontent? And what will it take? Because they want something that sounds very counter-positional. Counter they want more social services, more help from the state, and less taxes. How does this progressive wave that you envision work in the face of these demands? Well, I think it is important to uh, answer that question using what President Macron has himself said, not very recently, but before he, was, uh, before he moved to the Elysee, when he was still a candidate. Uh, I remember Emmanuel Macron very vividly saying that uh, there have to be reforms in France, but at the very same time, unless we have a federalist uh, re reform of the Eurozone, of the way the European Union is conducting its business, unless there is a common budget, a federal treasury of sorts in Europe, unless we have a proper banking union so that we end this pretense that we can have national banking systems without treasuries that can actually uh, do that which uh, the, the US Treasury is doing in salvaging them. He himself, President Macron, predicted that without these moves towards federalism, towards a kind of serious Eurozone reform, uh, the center cannot hold. And the European Union, he said, would be dismantled. That was Emmanuel Macron. He gets elected, and he puts forward an agenda for Eurozone reforms, which was very moderate and quite sensible. Uh, but the way in which he tried to carry out was a two-phase negotiation with Berlin. Phase one, he would Germanize France, especially with the labor market and the national budget, and then go to Mrs. Merkel and say, okay, now I've Germanized France, let's have a federal uh, Eurozone. That failed. It was a colossal miscalculation on his part because he Germanized France. He introduced austerity to the national budget. He made it easier for employers to fire, fire workers. He increased taxes for the poor and reduced them for the rich. And then when he put forward the proposals for re reforming the Eurozone, which for him were absolutely essential, necessary uh, prerequisites, uh, Mrs. Merkel said nine. And very soon after that, she lost power. Mm -hmm. So the explanation lies in the narrative of Mr. Macron, Macron himself. The center is not holding because we are not consolidating the European Union's economy the way that even Mr. Macron, who is more, more modern than I am in uh, his politics, uh, had uh, specified as absolutely necessary and okay. essential. So, so let me put the little devil's advocate then to you, because um, some economists do believe that some of the reforms he did put forth have actually produced results, the labor reforms and others. And, um, and, and, and the question here is that some also saw not a galloping French economy, but, but a move towards the French economy doing a little bit better and predictions that it would continue to do better if the reforms continue. The same in Germany, a still galloping economy. In Britain, the economy doing really, really well. In the United States, the economy is doing actually really, really well. And yet this malaise, and yet this, this rebellion against the governments whose, whose economies are doing well for them. So if this is the result, when the economies are going well, what happens when they go really badly, if that, if that seems to be the, if, that, if you predict that to be potentially the case down the line? Well, I think the, the key to understanding what's going on and answering your question is uh, to look at these economies uh, and manage to discern the fact that they're not uniform. You talked about Germany. Germany is indeed swimming in cash. It is swimming in surpluses. Everybody seems to be having surpluses. The federal government is in surplus. There is a majestic, gigantic trade surplus that Donald Trump is targeting. Uh, there is a um, 
There are corporations that are saving money and there are households that have savings. And yet, Christian, and yet, and this is a great paradox, which I think answers your question, half of the German population are far worse off today than they were 15 years ago. Similarly, you spoke about France and the reforms. Yes, it is true that Macron made business easier to conduct in France. But at the same time, he introduced austerity, which was effectively exported from countries like Greece into France. And that created whole regions in France that resembled Greece. In other words, areas of a Great Depression. And it is in those areas that the movement of, of the Gilets Jaunes, the, 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 the Yellow Vests, emerged before descending upon the streets of, uh, of, of Paris. You mentioned the United Kingdom. Well, why did Brexit succeed? It did not succeed because of some, of, of some deep antipathy towards the EU. It succeeded because a very large percentage of the population were being treated or felt that they were being treated like cattle that had lost uh, their market value. They felt discarded. They felt completely disenfranchised from a London-based economy which was, um, uh, as you said, uh, expanding very rapidly while large sections of the population and of the country were being left or held behind. Mm. This is the issue here. Divisions within our countries and between our countries growing while statistics at a macro level seeming to be prospering. So you have uh, uh, effectively national statistics that are prospering and large proportions of the population that are being discarded. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let me put this, this notion of division um, and nationalism and populism to you in, in this context. Steve Bannon, President Trump's uh, election campaign genius whiz who helped him win the election, has, as you know, been in Europe trying to round up all these extreme right national, nationalist parties and elements into what he called the movement to contest most particularly the upcoming European elections in May of next year. Um, this is what he says about his movement. The beating heart of the globalist project is in Brussels. If I drive the stake through the vampire, the whole thing will start to dissipate. We'll call it the movement or the cause or something like that. Everything yeah. converges on May of 2019. Yeah. And that's literally when we take over the EU. Uh, that, that is pretty frank and, 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 and rather chilling talk, actually, from a, a guy who's got a, a proven track record of, of getting a president elected with some of those views. Are you concerned or do you see your movement as going up directly against his movement? Listening to Steve Bannon sends a shiver down my spine because while nobody can accuse me of being uncritical towards Brussels and the European Union, this disintegrationist uh, nationalist narrative is what is going to lead to a great deal of pain being inflicted upon a majority of people in a majority of countries in Europe. This coalescence of nationalists is working towards disintegrating the European Union in a way that will only bring into power strongmen like Mr. Salvini in Italy, like Mr. Kurz in, in, in Austria, uh, like Mrs. Le Pen in, in France, the result being a dystopia, the result being a genuine postmodern version of the 1930s. And yes, DiEM25, our Democracy in Europe movement, while being very critical of the European establishment, we're going to fight Mr. Steve Bannon on, in every realm with a pan-European humanist narrative one that seeks to bring together the peoples of Europe, not to divide them and to disintegrate them. So I wonder whether you think that you will succeed, whether you are optimistic about the challenge you have at hand. And particularly, I want to ask you about one of the biggest rallying calls and cries to these nationalists is the issue of immigration. And, you know, the, the, the Hungarian foreign minister talked to me about, about this. I mean, they just do not want practically anybody except for white Christians to come in. And you know, the UN Migration Charter pretty much failed in Marrakesh with all the relevant countries sort of pulling out and refusing to sign on, and the United States not even sitting at the table. Listen to what the Hungarian foreign minister said about this central issue to me when we spoke in September. My question is, what is the legal 
or a moral ground for anyone to cross, to violate a border between two peaceful countries. These people came through Serbia, Croatia, Macedonia, Bulgaria, Greece, Turkey, all peaceful and safe countries. So it's not a fundamental human right that you wake up in the morning, you pick a country where you would like to live in, like Germany or Sweden, and in order to get there, you violate series of borders. This is not the way it should work out. So, I mean, there's a lot to question there, but nonetheless, uh, you get his point. What does your movement seek to do to address the fear and loathing around migration today? Well, isn't it interesting? You will recall that Hungary was uh, a communist country and lots of Hungarian uh, Democrats uh, fled the country and sought refuge by crossing borders. They, they sought refuge in Europe. And indeed, when the regime collapsed, we opened up our borders to Hungarians, to the Czechs, to the Slovaks, and so on. That is the fundamental basis of uh, a democratic Europe, mm -hmm. that we uh, feel stronger when we bring border fences down, mm -hmm. not when we erect them. Right. Uh, Europe does not have a problem with migration. Europe has a problem with austerity, with a failed economy, mm -hmm. with a failed economic system. And let me remind you something else which I think is of interest. Hungary has no refugees. Hungary has very few migrants. In my country, which is already suffering a, 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 a monumental economic collapse, we have tens and hundreds of thousands of refugees and, and mm -hmm. migrants. You do not have an anti-immigration feeling in this country. But you asked me whether I'm optimistic. Christian, I do believe very strongly that when it comes to politics, when it comes to fighting for democratic rights and for humanism, we don't have the right to uh, issue predictions. We have a moral right to do what is right and then simply to expect that hope is going to be the fuel that drives the success in the end. We will be watching. Yanis Varoufakis, thank you so much for joining us from Athens.